What are the best settings for this monitor? Now, that's very subjective. It depends on your own preferences. It depends on your unit. So when I say best settings, what I'm really talking about are the settings which worked on my unit for my preferences and according to the targets which I go for when I review with my colorimeter. So the first thing to be aware of in system setup, there's a power setting option. And if you have that set to power saving mode, when you actually first use the monitor, first turn it on, it should say it's going to be in standard mode. Do you want to switch over to power saving instead? You'd have to actually select that. So it should be in standard mode. But if you have it set to power saving mode, you'll see that a lot of the menus locked off. So if you find a lot of this is grayed out and you're not running in HDR, and I'll come on to that shortly, it's probably that you've got this power saving mode enabled will really restrict what you can do. So I've now got it on standard mode. And it's also activated a few things I didn't have activated before. But fortunately, as I was showing you before, if you're watching the OSD video, the full OSD video, you can save sets of settings and very easily recall them. So I have things as they were before. Actually, no, I don't. It's basically done a factory reset. So be very careful with this power mode. Don't change this unless you really have to. Make sure you change it as really the first thing you do because it seems to wipe your settings, which is a bit of a pain. I'm going to have to set everything up again. OK, so I've set that all up again. In a way, it was useful because it reminded me of all the settings that actually changed and why I changed them. So first up, you've got Adaptive Sync. This would be called VRR if you're using HDMI 2.1 VRR. It's called HDMI 2.1 VRR, although it's actually an HDMI 2.0 port. If you look at the bandwidth, it does have HDMI 2.1 capabilities, including HDMI 2.1 VRR. A little bit confusing, but basically this might be called VRR if that's what you're using. Otherwise, it'll be called Adaptive Sync. Whatever it's called, it'll be the first option in the gaming section. If you want to be using VRR, you have to have this set to on. Game visual, they're the presets of the monitor. The default racing mode is really very good, in my opinion. It gives you good flexibility. But really, these settings, uh, scenery mode's very funky, by the way. They just really set things to different values by default, and some of them will lock certain settings off. And the scenery mode clearly looks funky, but if you try to replicate this in a different preset, it wouldn't look quite the same. So it does seem to make some adjustments beyond just what you can see in the menu. For example, there's extreme oversaturation and crushing of shades, but the saturation is set to the correct default value of 50, the correct neutral value of 50. Anyway, it's more of the same with other settings as well. FPS mode gives you oversaturation. It also lowers your gamma to try and increase visibility. So if you find this useful competitively and you like how it's set up, of course, feel free to use it. So it's got shadow boost set to level three. That's a gamma enhancement, which targets mainly darker shades and lightens them up for that boost in visibility. And again, it gives you a saturation boost, which doesn't seem to correspond with the values here. sRGB mode, I wouldn't recommend using this. I mean, it is useful, except it is no more useful than using one of the other presets. Racing mode and user mode being the best balanced, but instead you can Go to color, display color space, and change that from DCI P3, which uses the full native gamut of the monitor. That'll give you the highest vibrancy, the strongest saturation, to sRGB. And that will clamp the gamut close to sRGB, which gives you more faithful output for most SDR content, which is designed around the sRGB color space. And with this active, this setting, it doesn't lock off anything else. You can adjust the brightness, you can adjust the color channels, the gamma. You get full control over everything. And I did briefly mention that user mode. I'm just going to show you MOBA. That's really funky. Maybe useful for MOBA games. I don't know. I don't play them. User mode. So that's really like racing mode, but you actually have a few more settings you can adjust if you wish to. There's saturation and six axis saturation. So the saturation slider, this is something you would adjust according to preferences. I don't really consider this a best setting. The best setting would just be to leave this alone. That gives you the more neutral the most neutral and as intended look. But if you wish to decrease this a little bit, you just find saturation a little bit too intense, for example, then you can do that. Just be aware that it's difficult to get the balance right. And I do find that some shades are undersaturated and others remain quite strongly saturated. It's just difficult to balance. There's also six axis saturation if you want more control over that kind of thing, but the same really applies. So for example, if you lower the red a bit, some red bias shades don't look quite right, and others have perhaps more appropriate saturation. But if you don't like how things look without these adjustments, please do feel free to make them. Be aware that if you increase anything beyond 50, then 
you're going to increase the saturation by pulling shades closer to the edge of the gamut without increasing the gamut itself. So that means you're crushing things together and you're losing shade variety. The next setting which I would focus on, brightness. This is something you adjust according to your own preferences and your room lighting. For me, with the other adjustments I make as well, that will affect the brightness levels. I found 64 worked well. That was, again, for my unit, my preferences, and my colorimeter targets. Uniform brightness. Generally, you'll want to have this switched on. What it'll do is it will mean that the monitor doesn't really use any ABL, automatic brightness limiter, or a very limited ABL will be used. This means that the brightness is pretty stable, so it's not going to fluctuate all over the place depending on how much bright content is being displayed on the screen. If you have uniform brightness disabled, then it can potentially go brighter, but it does depend on the content displayed. I didn't specifically touch anything else here, but in the evening I like to use low blue light settings. However, I don't like the implementation of low blue light on this particular monitor. That's because level 1, 2 and 3 actually give you higher blue light output than the factory defaults, which is pretty useless. Level 4 does reduce your blue light output, but also gives you a green tint. This is all explored in the written review. But an alternative low blue light setting is to go to color and change color temp to 4000K. For my regular settings, my test settings, I use the user setting here. I left red at 100, green is set to 93, and blue is set to 80. But this depends on your unit, they're not all going to be calibrated in the same way and things can drift over time as well. So this is just at the time of review on my unit what worked for me to get 6500k with a good neutral green channel as well. The gamma, I left that at 2.2, again that's my target. If you want things to look deeper then you could select 2.4 potentially, 2.6. If you want things to look, let's say, more visible, kind of washed out really, you can select 1.8, bit less of that, 2.0. But I think most people should really just stick to 2.2 unless you really just prefer a different setting or you have a work reason for using a different setting. And that's really all I changed for my test settings. Things are different under HDR. So I've got HDR running on the monitor. So you'll see that a lot of this is now greyed out. The main settings that you should focus on, yes you can use VRR at the same time as HDR if you wish. The HDR setting. Three different modes. On my NVIDIA GPU, whether I was using HDMI or whether I was using DisplayPort, these were exactly the same. It may depend on your firmware, it could potentially depend on your system or your GPU. So I would advise trying these out, seeing if they do differ for you, and just selecting the one you prefer, really. The other setting of interest under HDR is Color Temp. You can set that to 6500K, which gives you a nice neutral white point, a natural look. 8200K. That actually was higher than 8200K on my unit, depends on the brightness. So that is really a cool look, and I don't mean cool as in a good look, I mean cool as in a cool tinted look, very icy look. And that can accelerate visual fatigue, especially if you consider the high brightness levels which are being pumped out under HDR. The reason that they give you this option is because it will increase the brightness capability a bit, but it isn't exactly what I consider a huge difference in that respect. Yes, it gives you an edge, but the brightness capability, to be honest, is not massively different to the 6500K setting. And I just feel that the balance of the image is much better with that 6500K setting. There's also a brightness adjustable setting. I definitely don't consider using this a best setting, but there is a specific use case. So if you try and activate this, it says HDR PQ curve will be affected when the brightness adjustment is on under HDR mode. That means that if you lower the brightness, it doesn't neatly map things it's really optimized for the brightness to be set to 100, which is the same as having this setting disabled. But what this does is it unlocks your brightness slider. And if you really find things uncomfortable, you can't bear to look at the screen under HDR, you still want to use some of your HDR benefits, then you can reduce this. Because this is an OLED screen, it is worth exploring the screen protection features, which are found in the system setup section of the menu. First one there is screensaver. I'd leave this on. It's quite a good feature actually, I find. And what this will do is it will dim the screen if it isn't detecting much of a change in the display signal for several minutes. So it won't react to things like the clock changing, little movements, a blinking cursor, that kind of thing. It will ignore that. That won't stop it activating. 
but what it will do is it will dim the screen significantly and that can help reduce your chance of image retention or burn-in issues and that's really what these screen protection features are designed around because this is an OLED screen. I didn't have any issues with this during my brief review period but of course that is a brief review period so I can't speak for longer term use and it is worth taking a few precautions. So the screensaver is particularly useful. You don't have to be on the desktop for this to activate. If you had a game paused and there's not much going on in the game, then it could activate this feature as well. But in addition to this, I would recommend setting your power settings in Windows to turn the display off after a brief period of inactivity. I actually set it to 20 minutes in my review, but that's because I like to have the monitor warm and in a stable state for my review. But if I was just a regular user of the monitor, I would set this to something like perhaps five minutes or less. If you go away from the monitor, you're not using it and you're on the desktop, it will just turn the screen off or we'll put it into a low power state. Next up, there's pixel cleaning. This is something you activate manually by selecting this option. It's a little bit awkward actually. So when you use this, what will happen is the power LED will blink amber and the screen will look like it's switched off. It'll take about six minutes, as it says. Now, the reason I said it's awkward is that the monitor has a little reminder system. You can disable this if you want, but otherwise you can set it to two hours, four hours, or eight hours. There are actually other options if you're using Display Widget Center, which I'll show you at the end of the OSD video if you're watching the full OSD video. But this just gives you a little message towards the bottom right of the screen. And the message doesn't have an option to actually run the cycle, so you then have to go kind of deep into the menu to run it, which is a little bit weird. Aziz did say when I asked about it that it should automatically run the cycle, apparently after eight hours of use, but I've used the monitor for longer than that, cumulatively, without running the cycle, and it hasn't done it. So I'm not sure if it does do it automatically, or if it does, maybe it's a longer period. So my general recommendation, if you don't mind the reminder and you find that useful, then set it. Otherwise, just try and remember to do it, perhaps before you go to bed, maybe if you're making a meal. You don't have to be too obsessive with this, and certainly run it if you do notice some image retention on the screen and you want to try and get rid of that. But just try and run it when you can remember, you know, a few times a day. That should really be sufficient. Next, there is screen move. This is a setting which I really don't like. It was set to middle because that's the default setting, but I would like to set that to off. Thank you very much. Now, what this will do is it will cause the entire image to move so it's displaced. There's an active area between the panel border and the actual image. And unfortunately, even if you use the light setting here, it will actually run off the screen completely. So you'll lose some of the image when this is running. And it seems to run for several minutes at a time. So I find it extremely annoying, even with the light setting. The other settings will cause even more movement. The thing to remember about this setting, though, I mean, if you don't find any of these settings annoying, then of course, just feel free to leave them enabled. I'm just saying what I like to do here. But yes, if you are using this, then it's only, even with a strong setting, going to give you a reasonably slight movement and that means that larger white elements some of that the center of larger objects for example they're going to remain illuminated in the same way so this isn't really just a be all and end all of preventing image retention it's just sort of one mitigation measure and i really wouldn't feel too bad about disabling this it can certainly help with the edges of bright shades and that kind of thing and smaller bright elements can help prevent image retention or burn in there but it's really only going to do so much Next, you've got Adjust Logo Brightness. This is disabled by default, and I disabled it in the review just for consistency and because I didn't want this to kick in and cause any sort of issues with my observations or readings. But if you don't find this annoying or you don't really notice it doing anything, then that's probably a good thing. Just leave it set to on. If you do find it annoying, again, you can set it to off. They do give you that option. Potential issues with this kind of feature. It doesn't know exactly what a logo is and what's going to be non-disruptive. It could include HUD elements in a game. It could include various UI elements, which you don't necessarily want to be dimmed. So just be aware that it may not be something that you want to leave on. 